so that you may believe. We're gonna talk a lot about belief and unbelief through the book of John. Last week we started off awesome. Pastor Russell kicked us off on Easter Sunday morning uh, with the resurrection and talking about the deity, those first five verses in John, um, all about the deity of Christ, right? Uh, It was a phenomenal morning. Uh, He introduced us to the author of the book of John, who is John the Apostle. And this morning we're gonna look at another John in the book of John. Uh, Most of us would know him as John the Baptist, although ironically, while we may know him that way, in the book of John, he's referred 14 times as John the Witness, John the witness and never referred to as John the Baptist. So I'm gonna try to keep us clear this morning and refer to him as John the witness and uh, versus John the apostle. Uh, When I was in high school, I know this is gonna be hard for some of you to believe, but when I was in high school, uh, went to a large public high school, we had over 800 people in my graduating class and they divided us into homeroom by alphabet. So I was with a lot of other R's, Robinson, a lot of other R's. Well, in our home room, there were three, count them, one, two, three, other carries in that home room. Now there's probably only one in the rest of our total class, but there was one guy carry, spelled differently than my name, and then there was one female carry. Now get this, as they divided the home rooms, they also assigned lockers to the home room and I was assigned a locker with the two other carries. So there's three of us sharing one locker and all of us had the same first name, all spelled differently, but the same first name. So it was quite funny when somebody walked down the hall and they say, hey, Carrie, and all three of us happened to be at the locker. You can imagine what, how that was responded, how we responded. Um, but it could get confusing when we use the same name. And obviously John was a familiar name, but we have John the apostle and we have John the witness, John the witness. So um, if you look at this, uh, starting in verse, turn to your Bibles, turn to John, if you're not there already, chapter one, starting in verse six. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to be a wit- bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So let's stop just a second and have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your word. God, the way you use it in our life to move us into more like you. Father, for the ability that it has to correct us, to mold and shape us. And Father, I pray that this morning, as we look at this passage of scripture, that you help me to get out of the way. And Father, may you speak to our hearts. Father, I thank you for the power that is in your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've divided our passage this morning into two major sections. The first one is a man named John. This John the witness. And the second, which we'll get to in a little while, is the world's response to the light. And the light, going back to verses one through five, is the light of Jesus that has come into the world. But first, this man named John. He was a man sent. A man sent, a man sent from God and uniquely sent because remember his mother and father, Elizabeth and Zachariah, old in age, way past childbearing years and yet God blessed them with a child and he was to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He was also divinely commissioned. In Isaiah 40, verse three, it says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight to the desert a highway for our God. So he was divinely commissioned and he was uniquely sent, but he was a man, a man sent from God. And he was to be a witness about the light. Verse seven and eight says, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, John says, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, if you're like me and you read those two verses, it's like, John, I get it. He was not the light. He was to bear witness. Three times in those two verses, John says that John was a witness. 
He was a witness to the light. He was not the light, but he was a witness to the light. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I'm not dense. Now, repeated things like that draw our attention. There is a purpose why John the apostle is saying that this John is simply a witness. You know, John the witness had quite a following. There were people following him. And maybe by the time John the Apostle writes the book of John, he understands that there's still these, these group of followers that are following a man who is simply pointing them to the Messiah. And he wants to make clear that this John is just a witness. Now, what's the purpose of a witness? The purpose of the witness is to project or to share the light of the one that they're witnessing to. And this John, the witness, he was declaring Jesus to be the light of the world. He was declaring Jesus to be the very son of the living God. John 1, 23 says, he said, I am a voice crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So not only John the apostle says that John the witness was simply a witness, but John himself, John the witness says, I'm just a witness. I am one crying out as a witness. And he's crying out about this light. He, Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light of the world. Now, when you come into the, came into the room this morning, there was light. Now, testifying about the light is kind of a crazy thing. I don't have to draw your attention to the light. You see the light. Back in first century, it would have been a torch. But what we know about the light of God is that it's not only physical, but it's spiritual. You can't always see what God is doing in a person's heart and mind. People will say, you know, I will let my light shine by all of my activity, by the way I live my life. Well, absolutely, you should. But that's not where it stops. You also need to be a witness with your voice. You need to let that light shine before men verbally. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 through 6 says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as our servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, these, this idea of letting our light shine, of witnessing about the light is kind of a strange thing. My, I've got three uh, uh, kids and when they were little, they had these books called The Magic Eye. I don't know if they're still around today, but these magic eyes were pixelated pictures and there was a collage, there was a book full of them and uh, they were nice looking. There was all different kinds of colors, but on the surface, you really couldn't say, tell what it really was. It was kind of an illusion. But if you looked really hard in a certain way, all of a sudden an image would come to life, maybe of a bird or a tree or maybe a person. But... I had trouble seeing those images. The illusion kind of ev evaded me. But my kids would get it. And so they would say, hey, Dad, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to look at right here, steer really hard at this point. Or, can't you see, Dad, this is the tree? You know, and they would try to draw it out for me. They tried to help me. They would be a witness to that picture. And all of a sudden, if, if they were really good witnesses, I could see the picture clearly. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I get it. I get it, I see it now. God has called us to be a witness to the light. We testify to what blind men and women can't see. Now, as all good illustrations, they break down at some point. What we know is I am only as good as, my, as I can at witnessing, but ultimately God does removal of the scales of the, of the blind man's eyes. It's what God does, not what man does. But nonetheless, God has called us to be a faithful witness, not only in lifestyle, but also in words. In Romans 10, 14, he says, how then will they call on him whom they have, have, have not believed? How will they believe in him who they've never heard of? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? See, this matter of witnessing is a strange thing. Establishing the truth of the gospel and communicating that with others is what God has called us to. We are his ambassadors and we are to engage in being a faithful witness to the light so that the world might see. 
See, the miracle of spiritual sight is through, is, is through what happens when a faithful witness allows the world to see Jesus. It's pretty amazing that God would choose to use us in the means of bringing somebody to salvation. The miracle of spiritual sight through the gospel happens when witnesses tell blind people to look at Jesus and they describe what they see. And why do we do this? So that all might believe. We'll come back to the believe in a minute. But then John tells us that this John the witness was not the light. John the witness was not the light. In John 1, 19 and 20 says, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews and, and sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. See, this John the witness says, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the big deal. We generally like to be a big deal, don't we? And sometimes we like to witness things to make us a big deal. I, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of weddings around here. And the last one I did, I remember praying. And when I looked up, I looked up and there was like 150 people there. And there was like 50 telephone cameras looking at me. I felt like it was like a paparazzi or something. And then I get home and I open social media and I find that people have posted pictures of this wedding, celebrating this couple's wedding. And then I notice, hmm, you know, it's not family posting, it's all these other people that are posting. And then the, across my mind is witnessing the celebration of the union of husband and wife the most important in that thing in that moment? Or is being present at somebody's wedding celebration more about the person witnessing it than it is about the couple getting married? Are you following me? See, John understood that his witnessing was not about him. It was all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's the truth of the gospel. We need to be faithful in engaging as our witness, but ultimately we are pointing to him and it's never about us. Yeah, our witness is the great not, N-O-T. It's not about us. And John got it. John totally understood that this witnessing that he was doing, this proclaiming of the gospel, that he was a voice crying out in the wilderness was never about him. He was simply a means of pointing others to Jesus, the Messiah. It would be easy to think that John the witness was a big deal with his following but it was never about John, the witness. We live in a very celebrity-based culture, don't we? You know, we, people got famous, their, their, their favorite movie stars or you know, actors or musicians, but we live in a very celebrity-based culture. And that celebrity-based culture can overflow, and I'm afraid that it has all too often overflowed into churches today. And we see pastors that get that kind of celebrity-based culture, people following the man instead of the savior. I'm thankful that I work with a team of men and women that really understand that they're not the big deal, that it is all about Jesus and what he has done for the lost sinner. Personally, I find it incredibly humbling that God would choose to use me as that window to, for others to be able to see and to understand who Jesus is. See, he's called us to join him in the mission of the proclamation of the gospel that Jesus alone saves. And then the second big theme is the world's response to the light. Look at verses nine through 11. The true light, which gives light to everyone, has, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. He came to his own. He came into the world. He came to his own and the world did not receive him. It's pretty incredible. The true light, the light that Pastor Russell talked about last Sunday in verses one through five, the very identity of God, Jesus in the flesh, comes into the world 
world cosmos being humanity and his own people. And what do they do? They reject him. They rejected him. It's kind of like men and women do today. You know, Jesus comes to men and women. He comes to Fort Myers. He comes to school, the school, uh, public square and schools. And what happens is people reject him. And yet, and yet, all of creation in this idea of rejecting him and mankind and his own reject him. That's a crazy idea when you think that the creator of the world, the creator of man, and then man rejects the very sovereign savior of the world. I couldn't help but think, why do so many people reject the savior? You know, he extends this free gift of salvation Why do people reject this? I think it's our own sin sickness. You know, we're so more attracted to the sin of this world than we are for a savior. When I was in high school, I had a buddy that I hung out with. We played a lot of basketball together. His name's Ted. Ted was a starting point guard on our basketball team. He was homecoming king. He drove a pretty much new truck. Mom and dad, great had everything. You can imagine, you know, I went to a large public high school. You can imagine somebody, as I described, the popularity that he was, he could pretty much have everything he wanted, right? And in many ways he did. Well, we started hanging out together. I was real involved in my youth group. Ted was unchurched, family unchurched. And so as our relationship grew, I invited him to come to our youth group. And he started coming, started coming Sunday morning, started coming to the youth group, started praying for him that uh, he would come to know Jesus. We went months, months went by, no response. Summer came during our junior and senior year. I invited him, I said, hey, why don't you go to camp with us, church camp? Church camp will do it. It will seal the deal. He'll make a decision. Jesus will save him. I said, yeah, I'll go to to camp with you. There's some good looking girls there, I'm sure. So he signs up, goes to camp with us. All week, me and a couple other buddies were praying for Ted, Ted's salvation. End of the week comes. Ted doesn't get saved. A couple weeks later, we'd been playing basketball at our community center in town. And we're driving back from the court, pulled up in his driveway. And I said, Ted, I said, I gotta ask you something. I said, you've heard all about Jesus. You've heard the gospel. You went to camp. That should have done it. I said, what's holding you back from receiving Jesus? And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, Carrie, he said, I've got everything that anyone could ever want. I have it all. And through the world's eyes, Ted did have it all. Through a high school senior eye, Ted did have it all. But he was missing the greatest blessing of his life. But see, I think that that sin sickness, the hold of the world and the blindness that the enemy creates holds people back from receiving Jesus. A few weeks ago, I ran up to Publix to grab some lunch. And when I went in, I saw a site that I'd never seen before. There was this boy about 10 to 12 years old that was leading his blind, I'm assuming, mother around Publix. She had her hand on his shoulder and he was leading her and they were whispering back and forth. I, I, I found it kind of fascinating I'm sure that he was, what appeared, he was telling her what he could see, which she couldn't see, and then he would drop something in their basket. See, I wondered in that moment, what would she do without him? How the blind need a witness. How blind people need you and I to come alongside of them and allow them to put their hand on our shoulder and to guide us to Jesus. The blind need help to see. And then verses 12 through 13 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. But... To all who did receive him. So here, here John tells us, John the apostle tells us, you know, Jesus come into the world, but the world didn't receive him. 
Jesus had come to his own. They, his own didn't receive him. But, but there will be some who do. Now, let's play a, an audience participation here. I'm sure that in your lifetime, somebody has come to you and said, hey, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Which do you like first? Now, how many people would say, I want the bad news first? Raise your hand. Come on, participate. How many people say, I want the good news first? Now, see, I'm a bad news person. I want to end on the good news, right? So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, your test just came back. I've got some bad news. Tested positive. But I've got good news. We've caught this early enough. Statistically, you're 100% curable. Good news. I rather run out with that information, right? What about your students? Go in the classroom, take a test, fail the test. Teacher says, got some bad news for you. You failed the test. But I got some good news for you. You weren't the only one to fail the test, so we're going to do a retake. Good news. I like the good news, right? How about this? You walk into your employer, and your employer says, guess what? I'm going to have to cut you. I'm going to have to let you loose. Can't, uh, can't retain you anymore. Sunk, right? Bad news. But the good news is we're going to give you a year's severance pay. All of a sudden, both of them became good news, right? <laughs> it's a big but right there. But some will receive him. Some will receive him. Bad news, good news. And there's three key words that John gives us. As many as receive him, believe in his name, to them he gave you the right to become a child of God. So let's look at this receive. It's to take hold of, to grasp, to obtain. I've got three adult children. When they were little in the home, it was important for my wife and I that we serve good green vegetables, right? Every parent understands that. And probably most parents in here understand that the child that you're serving it to don't always receive it well, correct? But my wife would cook it, fix it, put it on the table. And my kids would sit there and look at it. Now, you can tell them that it's good for them, right? But putting it on the table before them doesn't do anything for their health. Until they receive it, till they reach out, take hold of it, ingest it, digest it, it won't become good for them. Until we reach out and receive the good news of Jesus, it doesn't do us any good. We have to do something. We have to reach out. John Piper gives the illustration about a home, how easy it is for people to say, when we receive Jesus, the idea of receiving him is when we open up the doors to our home or the doors to our heart and we invite him in completely. He has complete dominion over our life or in our home situation, over our home. It's not the same of opening up the doors to our house and saying, there's the living room, sit there. Oh, and if you need to use the bathroom, that ain't happening. You can stay right there in the living room. That's all you got. Now, receiving, opening up, retaining, allowing him to come in and to be in our life is a total consummation. And then the idea of believe. So we receive and believe. Receiving who he is and believing in what he has done. Now, this believing is used many times throughout the book of John, but it's always the verb form of the word. It's always an action. It's something that we do. We believe. Believing in Jesus, who he is, and what he has said, who he is. And you can't have a true believing in something if you have a love affair with the world. If you're more invested in the things of this earth, there's a tension that goes on to really believing in God. And see, this, the nature of believing is a humbling of. We have to humble ourselves, humble ourselves, and to receive and to believe in Jesus. And then he gives us the right to become a child of the living God. This idea of the right is that he, God, 
gives us, grants us the authority to become his child. So if you read that verse in 13, it's not us doing it, we're taking a step, but it's God who's granted us the privilege of becoming his child. And it is familiar language. It's, it's that childlikeness in our life, this nature of new birth, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We become his child as he has willed it. Charles Spurgeon says this, a man is like a watch which has a new mainspring, not a mere face and hands repaired, but new inward machinery with freshly adjusted works which act to a different time and tune. And whereas he went wrong before, now he goes right because he is right within. He has a transformation of our life from inside out when Jesus is present in our life, the receiving, believing, and becoming. I thought about this passage this morning and it kind of brought me to two different places. See, I I believe that many people, uh, probably most people in here would say, I've done the believing, receiving, and becoming. I am a child of God. I've recognized what Jesus did on the cross for me. I know that he, he, his identity here on this earth was for the purpose of redeeming me, that he shed his blood on the cross. Without the, forgiveness, without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness. I've done all that, Carrie. I believe that most people in here probably would say, that's, that's me. I have received I believe and I've become a child of the living God. And we're probably all at different levels of that, with spiritually, that sanctification, the working out of that process. But our identity is in Christ. I am a believer of Jesus for us. I think that the question is, then how are we doing on our witness? Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, if you have become a child of the living God, then you are his ambassador. You are a witness for him. So how are you doing as a witness for the living God? Are you bearing witness by the light that you're shining to other men? Are you using your voice to proclaim the gospel? And then the second group of people are those who would say, no, I'm not born again. I'm not born into the family of God. And clearly John makes that differentiation here, doesn't he? Some will receive him, but many will deny him. There's two obstacles to this new life. And the biggest one is our sin sickness. It's our attraction to the world and our own sin nature. But maybe this morning, as you've sat here or watching us online, the Holy Spirit is drawing you and convicting you of your need for a savior. Your recognition of your lostness. And you come to that place where you know that in my current state, I am lost without a savior and I need Jesus. Jesus wants to redeem you. And Jesus wants to, for you to respond to that, that, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit in your life, drawing you to himself, convicting you of your need for a savior. I believe that the Spirit of God is able to do exactly that. That God is living and active and he's able to open the eyes of the blind so that they may see the truth of the gospel.